This video may not be easy to watch. The subject matter is a little grim. I'll warn the squeamish to look away from any really graphic parts. It had been just a beautiful late fall day when I heard the noise of a dying deer near our home. My brief encounter with this deer inspired me to write a poem which I'll read to you in a few moments. I didn't happen to have a really good camera with me. And I thought about maybe shooting some video just on my cell phone, but my instinct was to just take in the moment and reflect on it for a while first. I did go back later with a camera to capture something for this video. The deer was not in good condition, but I wasn't sure at first exactly why it was dying. There were sores on its body that made me think it could have gotten itself tangled up in old barbed wire. I'll find this stuff out here in the woods. Usually it's just old strands set aside from having been replaced. Now they're half buried and grown over in the forest. The situation with the deer reminded me of a poem by the late William Stafford. Bill is the greatest poet ever to have called Oregon home, and his probably, probably his very most famous poem is Traveling Through the Dark. I wish I could read it for you here, but getting permission for that copyright seemed a little daunting. So, I'll just put a link to his poem in the video description along with the text of my poem. I'll share a few more thoughts with you after I read my poem. On the edge of this wilderness. A deer died this morning. I heard his struggling in the woods not too far off Loader Road. There was nothing I could do for him. The deer, a young buck, was not afraid as I approached. Kneeling, I scratched the deer's neck the way our goats like to be scratched. I spoke quietly, apologizing that there was nothing I could do for him. My first thought was that he was sick and dying from infected wounds from barbed wire. There were fresh wounds on the legs and some large tumors on his side. Checking later, I learned that such tumors are not uncommon or life-threatening. Even if it had been disease, it was too late for antibiotics. There was nothing I could do for him. There had been no recent gunshots or screeching tires. There were no predators stalking nearby that I could see or hear. I don't think I interrupted a kill. We were alone, still, together, breathing in the air on the edge of this wilderness. Breathing in this moment was all I could do for him. His struggle was almost over. I had a knife 
and thought about killing him quicker so as to not prolong the pain. That was not something I could do for him. Perhaps he was hit by a car and only succumbed to his injury later when I happened along. Our moment stretched through his last few breaths, a long, short time of nothing I could do for him. We can only acknowledge what can only be acknowledged. We can only witness what can only be beheld. I walked away wondering if dwelling on what I could do for him was the best thing I could do for him. How many poems have language like, my first thought was that he was sick and dying from infected wounds from barbed wire. If language can still make you uncomfortable, then language is still powerful. The figurative language of being on the edge of a wilderness isn't just referring to the fact that we were close to the border of forest and pasture. The moment between life and what comes after is also an edge. What do you think? Is life itself the wilderness or is the wilderness what comes after? Struggling to accept the fact that sometimes there's nothing we can do to avoid the end is like being on the edge of a wilderness. And it's something we all have or will face. I did take one piece of artistic license with the poem. I didn't actually stay for the deer's very last breath. I felt after maybe a minute that he had chosen a very peaceful private spot to die and that maybe I was intruding on his death. I hope the concern and humanity that I tried to convey was reassuring at the time, but I did leave him to pass on his own. The deer never actually cried out. The noises that I heard were just his body falling and moving a little bit in the leaves on the ground. By the time that I got to him, he only moved his head just a little, maybe once or twice. He was almost gone. There were practical decisions to be made at this point. What do I do with a fresh dead deer carcass? Those tumors that I googled that turned out not to be life-threatening also meant that the meat wasn't inedible. Evidently, you should just cut carefully around those things, but I didn't want to try and butcher anything that large. I've processed plenty of chickens and rabbits and quail, but nothing really larger, and I didn't want to start with, with this deer. I didn't want to start learning with this deer. It is a relatively cold time of year, so the meat wasn't going to go bad anytime soon. I called a hunter friend of mine to see if he was interested in some free deer meat. And he would have been, but he was a little busy in the middle of a home remodeling project. Had the deer been larger and older, with a really big rack, he probably would have come straight over. But the deer the deer's horns were only about five inches long. It's hard to guess, but I'd say the deer was maybe a, a little more than a year old. My friend said that if he had been hit by a car, then some of the meat would be ruined, but not all of it. Showing what I'm about to show you goes against a lot of what I've been trying to do on this channel, which is presenting relaxing, beautiful sequences of cute farm animals and, and serene landscapes. 
but there is beauty in knowing that we do live on the edge of a pocket of true wilderness. I decided to let wilderness be wilderness and allowed the coyotes to take care of that deer in their own time. This is the point that you should look away if you don't want to see anything too graphic. This is day two. I heard some coyotes this morning and they have definitely found the deer. This is gruesome and probably not easy to watch, but it is nature at work. Checking in again the next day, about half of the deer remains. All right, it's been a couple more days and the deer is definitely been drug around. And a little more devoured. On the edge of this wilderness. A deer died this morning. I heard his struggling in the woods, not too far off Loader Road. There was nothing I could do for him. The deer, a young buck, was not afraid as I approached. Kneeling, I scratched the deer's neck the way our goats like to be scratched. I spoke quietly, apologizing that there was nothing I could do for him. My first thought was that he was sick and dying from infected wounds from barbed wire. There were fresh wounds on the legs and some large tumors on his side. Checking later, I learned that such tumors are not uncommon or life-threatening. Even if it had been disease, it was too late for antibiotics. There was nothing I could do for him. There had been no recent gunshots or screeching tires. There were no predators stalking nearby that I could see or hear. I don't think I interrupted a kill. We were alone. Still, together, breathing in the air on the edge of this wilderness. Breathing in this moment was all I could do for him. His struggle was almost over. I had a knife and thought about killing him quicker so as to not prolong the pain. That was not something I could do for him. Perhaps he was hit by a car and only succumbed to his injury later when I happened along. Our moment stretched through his last few breaths, a long, short time of nothing I could do for him. We can only acknowledge only be acknowledged. We can only witness what can only be beheld. I walked away wondering if dwelling on what I could do for him was the best thing I could do for him. You know, a lot of us have hit deer on the road. Perhaps you weren't driving too fast and the animal got up and ran away. We want to tell ourselves that the animal is just fine, but it probably isn't. Please drive careful out there.